for those of you that want more of a kind of scientific frame of reference, I wanted to share just some articles. There's a lot of resources, tools, uh, information, um, articles on, the, on uh, some of our supporting websites. Uh, I've probably got about maybe four to 5,000 pages of formula notes and archives that I've used over the last number of years. Um, I just wanted to pick a few gems out to share with you so that you have kind of an idea as to you know, where some of this is kind of coming from science-wise. Um, so these are a few gems that I picked out that I think will give a frame of reference. This is an article, um, uh, CBC News, uh, Friday, March 9th, uh, 2007. The title is, Scientists Say Nerves Nerves Use Sound, Not Electricity. The common view that nerves transmit impulses through electricity is wrong, and they really transmit sound, according to a team of Danish scientists. This is from CBC News, by the way. Uh, the Copenhagen University researchers argue that biology and medical textbooks that say nerves relay electrical impulses from the brain to the rest of the body are incorrect. Uh, this is in quotes. For us as physicists, this cannot be the explanation, said Thomas Heimberg, an associate professor at the university's Niels Bohr Institute. Feel fit the physical laws of thermodynamics tells us that electrical impulses must produce heat as they travel along the nerve, but experiments find that no such heat is produced. Uh, Heimberg, an expert in biophysics who researched his PhD from the Pl Max Planck Institute in Go I can never pronounce this word right, Gottingen, uh, Germany, where biologists and physicists often work together in a rare arrangement, developed a theory with Copenhagen's University Andrew, Andrew Jackson, an expert in theoretical physics. According to the traditional explanation of molecular biology, an electrical pulse is sent from one end of the nerve to the other with the help of electrically charged salts to pass through ion channels in a membrane that sheaths the nerves. That membrane is made of lipids and proteins. Heimberg and Jackson theorized that sound propagation is a much more likely explanation. Although sound waves usually weaken as they spread out, a medium with the right physical properties could create a special kind of sound pulse, or soliton, that can propagate without spreading or losing strength. Um, now, the reason that that's important is that um, if there is a kind of uh, solitonic uh, or analog to acoustic energy going on through the nerves, uh, then what that means is um, we should be able to modulate the entire organism through the autonomic and parasympathetic nervous system by sending a direct acoustic signal information. And this is probably one of the reasons why the frequencies are working so well, because they're intelligently coded information that's penetrating deeply enough for the nervous uh, system to actually pick it up. And we know that it's the nervous system that you know, basically controls a lot of things in the, in the body. Interesting fellow, Dr. Ken Hashimoto, uh, regular consultants uh, on lie detection for the Japanese police, read about uh, some experiments by a fellow named Baxter. Um, so he decided to hook up one of his family's cactuses to a polygraph lie detector by means of acupuncture needles. Um, his intent was more revolutionary than his predecessors. He hoped to enter into actual conversation with a plant. He developed a system whereby nothing more than a cassette tape is needed to record the reactions of a suspect. Electronically transposing the modulations of the suspect's voice he was able to produce on paper, on a paper, a running graph, reliable enough to pass in Japan's court system. By reversing the system, he would be able to transform the tracings from a graph into modulated sounds, giving voice to a plant. His wife got involved because she had the green thumb of the family. She, ass she assured the cactus that she loved it, and there was an instantaneous result from the cactus. Transformed and amplified, the sound produced by the plant was like a high-pitched hum of very high voltage wires heard from a distance, except that it was more like a song. The rhythm and tone being varied and pleasant at times even warm and jolly. Miss Hashimoto was being answered by the plant in modulated cactus, a plant song. The Hashimoto's became so intimate with their cactus that they were soon able to teach it to count and add up to 20. Um, and, so, and so here's an example of, um, of uh, getting a very precise emotional reaction on a simplistic level, uh, but measurable and chartable in a rather unusual way 
from a plant. Uh, uh, this is some stuff from Benevenist. Uh, University's Ca Cavendish Physics Laboratory, uh, Benevenist suggested that the specific e effects of biologically active molecules such as adrenaline, nicotine, and caffeine, and the immunological signatures of viruses and bacteria can be recorded and digitized using a computer sound card. A keystroke later, and these signals can be winging their way across the globe courtesy of the internet. Biological systems far away from their activating molecules can then, he suggested, be triggered simply by playing back the recordings. Benevenist's explanation starts innocuously enough with a musical analogy. Two vibrating strings close together in frequency will produce a beat. The length of this beat increases as the two frequencies approach each other. Eventually, when they are the same, the beat disappears. This is the way musicians tune their instruments, and Benevenist uses the analogy to explain his water memory theory. Thus, all molecules are made from atoms which are constantly vibrating and emitting infrared radiation in a highly complex, in a highly complex manner. These infrared vibrations have been detected for years by scientists and are a vital part of their armory of methods for identifying molecules. Uh, however, precisely because of the complexity of the infrared vibrations, molecules also produce much lower beat frequencies. It turns out that these beats are within the human audible range, 20 to 20,000 hertz, and are specific for every different molecule. Thus, as well as radiating in the infrared region, molecules also broadcast frequencies in the same range as the human voice. This is the molecular signal that Benevenist detects and records. If molecules can broadcast, then they should also be able to receive. The specific broadcast of one molecular species will be picked up by another, tuned by its molecular structure to receive it. Benevenist calls this matching of broadcasts with reception co-resonance and says it works like a radio set. Thus, when you, turn, when you tune your radio to, say, classic FM, both your set and the transmitting station are vibrating at the same frequency. Twitch the dial a little and you're listening to Radio 1. Different tuning, different sounds. This, Benevenist claims, is how millions of biological molecules manage to communicate at the speed of light with their own corresponding molecule uh, and no other. It also explains why minute changes in the structure of a molecule can profoundly alter its biological effect. It is not these tiny structural changes uh, that make it a bad fit. May, ah. It is not that these tr tiny structural changes make it a bad fit with its biological receptor, the classical clock, lock and key approach. The structural modifications detune the molecule, molecule to its receptor. What is more, and just like radio sets and receivers, the molecules do not have to be close together for communication to take place. I, I took this off some site. I can't remember who, who it was, but full credit to the author of that. So this is taken, I think this is taken from The Secret Life of Plants. Um, an important difference between Lawrence's apparatus for capturing plant signals and that of Baxter, Vogel, and Salvin is that it incorporates in a temperature-controlled bath living vegetal tissue shielded behind a Faraday tube that screens out even the slightest electromagnetic interference. Lawrence found that living vegetal tissue is able to perceive signals far more delicately than electronic sensors. It is his belief that biological radiations transmitted by living things are best received by a biological medium. As Lawrence checked his instrumentation, uh, these are all snippets, by the way, I'm pulling it out of a document, uh, just highlights. Uh, as Lawrence checked his instrumentation, the audio signal, to his amazement, continued to produce a distinct chain of pulses for over half an hour before even the whistle returned, indicating that nothing more was being received. The signals had to be coming from somewhere, and since his device had been continuously pointed up toward the heavens, Lawrence was faced with a fantastic thought that something or someone was transmitting from outer space. That's taken from an excerpt where he's got this gadget pointed to a certain um, latitude and longitude uh, up into the sky, um, and he's using a very fragile, very sensitive biomass to detect incoming cosmic radiations, and he's interpreting it as, as though these incoming radiations have a form of intelligence. I'm surmising that he was probably just picking up... Um, I mean, I don't know if he was picking up any kind of form of intelligence, but I, I'm surmising that it was probably a kind of incoming uh, radiation that we just hadn't mapped before because we didn't have delicate or sensitive enough, sensitive enough instruments. And my best guess is it was probably some kind of, some kind of weird organic signal coming from a planet. At least that's what I've been seeing in my work. Um, aligning his telescope coupled with a Faraday tube, a camera, an electromagnetic interference monitor, and the tissue chamber to celestial coordinates 10 hours, 40 minutes, plus 56 degrees, which gave him the general direction for Ursa Major. 
Lawrence switched on his audio signal. After a 90 minute interval, his equipment again picked up a recognizable, though briefer, pattern of signals. According to Lawrence, the periods between rapid series of pulses ranged approximately 3 to 10 minutes over a stretch of several hours as he monitored a single spot in the heavens. Uh, it's another snip. Um, an apparent train of interstellar communication signals of unknown origin and destination has been observed. Since interception was made by biological sensors, a biological type signal transmission must be assumed. Test experiments were conducted in an electromagnetic deep fringe area, the equipment itself being impervious to electromagnetic radiation. Follow-up tests revealed no equipment defects. Because the biological detector, interstellar listening experiments are not conducted on a routine basis, the suggestion is advanced that verification tests should be conducted elsewhere, possibly on a global scale. The phenomena is too important to be ignored. Uh, Lawrence's most important conclusion that biological type sensors are needed in order to intercept biological signals applies particularly to communications from outer space, as he puts it. Standard electronics are next to worthless here since biosignals appear to reside outside of the known electromagnetic spectrum. Um, now, what's really interesting about Lawrence's work is that, if I remember correctly, um, uh, his component has actually been incorporated into uh, many um, standard radio telescopes used at observatories. So what that means is governments and big corporate funded radio telescopes parked on some mountain someplace on Maui uh, that cost gazillions of dollars have got this little kind of chamber inside of them full of a, a gelatinous bunch of stuff in a little cube and it's actually hardwired into the radio telescope of that observatory for the express purpose of picking up extraneous data signals from space. Now, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not, this is nothing, I have no idea about his claim about intelligence from outer space. That's his thing. But what I can say is this. With my findings and the equipment set that I've got, when I monitor emissions coming in from a cosmic source, um, they definitely have a flavor or tone different from what we're often told about uh, you know, planets having. Um, but you can actually hear things like planets and stars online. There's lots of resources where scientist uh, uses, say, some kind of receiver and picks up the magnetic field of Saturn. And then he converts the magnetic field of Saturn to, uh, you know, an acoustic representation so you can actually hear the magnetic field.